before you do make a craniotomy. So, or you might have to temporarily insert a, a drain into the ventricular system before you open the dura and go on to remove the tumor. So sometimes it 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 do help in you know to make make the brain lax before you enter into the dura and um, go on to excise the tumor per se. So one is the presence of the hydrocephalus, which you must look forward in an any MRI of, of such type of patients. Secondly, the type of the tumor. The most important is is the uh, is the interface of the uh, tumor with the brain and the brain stem. This is very important and you have to very carefully examine uh, the MRI before you go on to operate on such type of tumors, especially this particular point. In this patient, you see that there is a CSF cleft, which is, which is well seen at some places, which is not seen at some places. So this gives you a fairly clear idea as to, you know, how much amount of difficulty you are going to encounter during the surgical dissection of this tumor from the adjacent brain structures. Of course, if, if the, the, you see a clear CSF cleft around the tu all the tumor, then your chances of having a clean dissection, they are more as compared to when there is absence of any CSF cleft in this. Second important thing that you have to look for in such type of MRI patients with, uh, with these tumors is, the extension of the tumor into the meatus. So as you can see that there is not much of an extension of the tumor into the meatus in this patient. So I preferably am not pre-planned to, you know, to drill uh, the meatus in such type of a patient if the tumor is very, very stuck to the facial nerve. I would electively choose to, you know, to leave some of the tumor in the meatus because it is not going very much into the meatus. I will show you in the uh, video shortly as to how, how I did it. Remember always, this is a benign tumor and uh, um, for a benign tumor, you should do no more harm uh, uh, with your surgery uh, and, and the, your, your patient should be better than what he was in the preoperative period. It is not a malignant tumor. So your efforts are concerted towards saving the neurology, saving the function in these type of patients rather than removing some more of the tumor and giving the patient a temporary or possibly a permanent deficit. Primum non nacer, we all know about it. This is the crux of any surgery that you do for benign lesions. So uh, this is the, uh, uh, the, the thing which I was talking about. Look, the CSF clef, when you see such type of a cystic space, white, hyperintense area, then this is a good thing, good news for an operating neurosurgeon. I mean, you can get in the cleft, you can get in to dissect some of the tumor or most of the tumor from the, uh, from the cerebellum and the brainstem. The third thing which you have to look forward in the MRI is the changes in the adjacent brainstem. Now, especially in the T2 weighted images, when you see hyperintense areas in the brainstem, this means that uh, this is not a good sign. And mm, uh, even if you do a small amount of handling here, then this could lead to disastrous consequences, uh, hemodynamic complications during the surgery and um, uh, later also might create some problems in the post-op period. So this is the information that you have to, you know, to extract from the preoperative MRI pictures of these patients. You have to study these images in great detail and uh, 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 they allow you to, you know, to, to prepare yourself uh, for and uh, during the surgery. And this is the uh, diffusion weighted image. And the importance of a diffusion weighted image is, uh, is to show you the consistency of the tumor, how solid or cystic the tumor is, and also the uh, changes in the brain stem or the cerebellar area. Uh, if these changes are present, if the diffusion weighted changes are present, then this means that this is not a good thing to have actually. So this is about the MRI as to what you will uh, uh, look for forward in, in the patient's MRI. Why will you get a CT done or not? The, uh, the, 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 the planning, as far as the planning is concerned, you have to study these images very, very carefully before the surgery. In the operating room, a night before surgery also. So this patient um, had the plan of undergoing a right-sided keyhole retromastoid craniotomy. And of course, my all the surgeries 
are endoscopic assisted and which i what what i do is i use a 30 degree endoscope and i take in between the surgical procedure after the surgical procedure in order to see the completeness of the tumor axis and and uh, as i will know now one word about keyhole is a keyhole does not necessarily mean that this should be as small opening as possible this is as a small opening as is comfortable for the surgeon and uh, uh, during the surgery this does not necessarily mean a 1 cm craniotomy or a 2 cm this is an appropriate opening which takes uh, takes us inside the the skull and enables us to remove the tumor completely without causing any complications now as we uh, will shortly see in the operative video so the special equipment required is uh, this uh, neuro monitoring of course i mean this is can, this surgery cannot be done without a neuro monitoring of the facial nerves of the fifth nerve of the lower cranial nerves of the brain stem so this is an absolute must to have before you embark on this performing this surgery image guidance system yes i use it every time it is not so mandatory to use but i mean if you are using a keyhole approach then this becomes a even 2 mm of uh, skin in season uh, if you can save uh, i mean it is absolutely worth it so you have to accurately place your craniotomy uh, by the use of uh, this image guidance endoscope as i already mentioned you can choose to um, electively use it during the surgery after the surgical procedure in order to you know to visualize uh, the completeness of the tumor axis and um, i use 0 degree and 30 degree more uh, um, to achieve this aim now the patient positioning now every good surgery begins with proper positioning and you have to personally present physically present inside the operation theater in order to uh, to to you know to do <laughs> i mean this is your <laughs> initial step i mean in order to accomplish a successful surgery now that there are three things to to remember in this uh, uh positioning in the acoustic neuroma there are three positions you have to remember all three now there are many threes in an acoustic neuroma i will shortly tell you the, in the positioning the threes are one is the flexion of the neck like this maximum flexion as much as your anesthetist allows and sometimes if you can cheat him the more the better so i mean if you can flex it and rotate the neck to the opposite side depending on certain factors i will tell you shortly and then laterally tilt the neck now every position every aspect of this position three positions have got a specific role uh, in uh, with that will make your life comfortable during the surgery by flexing of the neck what you do is you uh, bring the sternum magna up and by similarly by lateral tilting of the neck and pulling the shoulder down you open up the axilla of the uh, this space so that you have much room to you know to act and remove the and manipulate the things inside the uh, skull during the surgery so one is a tilting of the neck another is shoulder pulling down the flexion of the neck brings the sternum magna up it becomes easier for the sternum for you to open the sternum magna and release the csf the third position is the rotation of the uh, of the of the neck like this or like this ipsilateral or contralateral now this you have to decide whether you have to uh, to turn the neck ipsilaterally or contralaterally this is decided by the extent of the tumor now suppose if you have to drill the meatus and the meatus drilling is your priority if the tumor extends too much into the meatus then what you do is you have to you have to uh, uh, turn your face uh, the the nose ipsilaterally so that you looking bang on onto the petrous bone do you understand this i mean this is my uh, does everyone understand this if you are going to drill the meatus if your priority is to drill the meatus the more you turn the neck 15 to 20 degree the more concentrated you are your focus of vision will be on the petrous bone on the meatus however if your purpose is to look more towards the brain stem side more towards the cerebellar side then you have to turn your neck more contralaterally so this is very important point that you have to keep in mind and this all planning is to be made by looking on the mri scans 
before the surgery. So let's see how does this look like. Patient is of course in a in a uh, lateral position and uh, on a three pin. And this is what I was telling you. The shoulder is being pulled down. The neck is tilted. And so that there is an ample space. This is your operating room. This is your operating area. And you operate in a sitting position, of course. So um, when, you, when you tilt the neck down towards the floor, pull the shoulders and flex the neck, this area opens up so that you have ample space. Anyone can ask you the question in between. I mean, this is not a monotonous lecture which is going on. Let me let me be very clear. If anyone is uncomfortable at any point of time, uh, then uh, anyone is free to ask questions. It should be more and more uh, interactive rather rather than I mean I being speaking uh, in a monotonous manner. I can see. I hear. Hi, I. Good to see you, man. Samit, what do you yes. think about sitting position, man? Yeah, I mean, I was expecting this question. I mean, somebody, that is why I stopped here. And <laughs> Well, I mean, this is the first choice. I mean, in the initial part of my career, I mean, I did a couple of uh, acoustics in a sitting position too. But I mean, it's, uh, my boss likes it. It's his favorable approach. I mean, um, Professor Papa loves to, you know, to do a sitting position. Everybody in the world knows that. But I mean, I am quite uh, skeptical of that position because, I mean, you work, for about two hours or three hours, you work like that. I mean, uh, your hands get tired. And of course, I'm not that well built as you, I have. You have a six pack app. So, so I prefer to, you know, to do it in a lateral position. And plus there are other problems also. I mean, as you may or may not agree with the sitting position. I mean, uh, like for example, air embolism. And of course it has its own advantages. I agree to that. I mean, but I mean, it's all a matter of personal concern, personal choice. I mean, I preferably, uh, like to do uh, acoustics, uh, preferably in uh, in the lateral position. Now, my um, approach would be for a sitting position when when the tumor is very high up, when the tumor is very high up, which is not very much the case with the acoustic neuromas. However, it can be with tentorial meningiomas. So, in in the tumors which are attached to the tent, going very anteriorly then I would prefer to maybe electively choose to do the tumor surgery in a sitting position. Otherwise, acoustics nowadays, I don't do in uh, this sitting position anymore now. So uh, I hope I answered your question. I, is it okay? Yeah, excellent. One more question, Sumit. Um, do you drill the IAM before tumor resection or do you drill the IAM after some part of the tumor is resected? Uh, well, I mean, uh, my personal, uh, uh, I feel safe when I remove about some three-fourths of the tumor. When the tumor becomes more more mobile, more manipulated, then I prefer to go on to the meatus and drill it. And uh, my, uh, I am not preconceived before going into the surgery that I will drill the meatus or not. Uh, I study the preoperative MRI. If the tumor is not very much into the cana, into the meatus, like in this patient, I would be not very keen to drill the meatus in that patient, especially if the patient is very, very particular about her, her or his facial nerve preservation. So uh, 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 my choice to drill would be, uh, is decided on the operating table, actually. Uh, and many times I, I go in with the idea of drilling the meatus, but then if the tumor is stuck to the facial nerve and I'm very desperate to, patient is very desperate to save the facial nerve, I electively don't drill the uh, this thing. But if I choose to drill it, I would definitely not do it in the first instance. I would decompress the tumor. I would remove about some, maybe say three fourth or maybe 70%. Uh, and then I would go on to, you know, to drill the meatus. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So let's uh, let's uh, move forward in this. So you can see that this is the flexion of the neck, and uh, this is you have to really fight with the anesthetist to achieve that amount of flexion, and this is really important to achieve that during during the surgery in the positioning, and the reasons I already mentioned. And you see that the, uh, the the neck is slightly rotated. Now coming to the incision, this is the incision, and how do you uh, uh, do plan it? I mean, uh, now if you have got image guidance then you are a rich man and you are a fortunate man and you can you know you can uh, uh, accurately localize millimeter by millimeter the position of the 
uh, of the transfer sinus and the sigmoid sinus junction. So this is the transfer sinus. This is the sigmoid sinus. Can you see my arrow over the screen? I hope everybody can see this arrow over the screen. Yes, we can. Yeah, we can see it. Okay. So uh, now this line is important. Now this line is drawn. If you suppose you don't have image guidance, then I'm talking about that scenario as to how to choose your incident. Now a line is drawn from the base of the mastoid, which is here. The tip of the mastoid is here. The base of the mastoid is here and the ineon is here. So a line is drawn from the base of the mastoid to the ineon. And this is the presumptive site, presumptive location of the, of the transfer sinus. And uh, you have to place your burr hole somewhere here over the transfer sinus sigmoid sinus junction. So this is very, very important. And uh, suppose you place it too low, then you will be struggling all throughout your surgery. And this is the first most important step in, in your acoustic neuroma surgery to place your incision. Now, uh, certain things have, you have to keep in mind while you are giving a keyhole incision. Now, as I already mentioned, keyhole is not necessarily a one centimeter or a two centimeter incision. It, the keyhole in different acoustics is tailored according to the size of the tumor, according to the location of the tumor, according to the extent of the tumor into the meatus, according to the extent of the tumor into the medially into the brainstem. So this was uh, the uh, chosen incision in this patient. And as you can see shortly, uh, this is how it looked like. Now this is a single stab incision, a single uh, uh, stab cut through the skin, the muscles, and uh, um, uh, and then you uh, denude the bone of the periosteum, and then you see there are three important sutures, uh, which you have to, which you shortly encounter. Now this this suture, this suture, and this suture. Now there are the three sutures. This is the occipital mastoid suture. This is the peri occipital parietal suture, and this is the occipital. Uh, 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 parieto-occipital suture, and this is the uh, parieto-mastoid suture. The junction or the confluence of these sutures is the presumptive location of the sigmoid transfer sinus junction. And it is here that you have to place your uh, uh, your first burr hole uh, while making a craniotomy. I always prefer to make a craniotomy and then replace the bone flap once the surgery is complete. Of course, it's got its advantages over and above than what doing a craniotomy. The incidence of a, of a post-craniectomy syndrome is uh, negligible or almost none if you make a craniotomy bone flap. So uh, this is what uh, the this is the location of the uh, sigmoid transfer sinus junction as you see here, and uh, uh, the shortly you will see the craniotomy uh, also. This is the size of the craniotomy. You see that this was about. Uh, almost 3.5 by uh, 2 centimeters in size. And uh, well, uh, so before I start the surgical video, I want to tell you some rules about of acoustic neuroma surgery. The first most important rule is do not use a bipolar anytime any time during the surgical procedure. Very little. If, I, if you have to use your bipolar, then this means that uh, that there's something wrong, which is, uh, I mean, uh, the philosophy of doing this surgery is to not to use a bipolar. Uh, because if you use a bipolar, then you will destroy the arachnoid planes. And this is an arachnoidal surgery. This is a beautiful surgery, which is always made beautiful by the preservation, by the respect of the arachnoidal membranes. And if you do a bipolar and destroy the adhesion, destroy the planes, uh, the bipolar causes coagulation of the arachnoid membranes to the tumor capsule, everything is lost. So the first dictum of this surgery is to not to use a bipolar. And as you can see in my video, uh, I have trained myself now to use this bipolar as little as possible. I understand that without using a bipolar, it will be very difficult to do the surgery, but you can train your instincts to at least not to use bipolar outside the tumor anywhere. Of course, I mean, inside you can use the bipolar, of course you have to use, but outside the tumor capsules, no bipolar use. The second dictum of the surgery is, there are certain instruments which are particularly helpful in doing this surgery. And I do this surgery 
by means of two instruments only see every uh, tumor has got its own philosophy of dealing with as you all might agree to uh, this tumor perhaps um, is um, the, the, the two most important equipments or uh, i should say instruments they are a flat dissector and the second instrument is a tumor holding cap and these two instruments can completely do away your wonderful surgery you do not need any third instruments for doing this type of tumor so uh, always remember a rotten flat dissector of your choice and it has to be particularly sharp so as to separate the arachnoid peel out the arachnoid away from the tumor capsule and preserve the arachnoid peel away the arachnoid and preserve the uh, um, the planes and the number two dissector is number two instrument is the is the tumor holding which lifts the tumor and then so that you can you can feel the arachnoid more slid in the the, the cotton patty beneath the tumor capsule lift the tumor slid some more cotton patty this is how it goes so these are certain essential instruments that you have to look forward for in the caustic neuroma surgery okay so uh, as i told you acoustic neuroma surgery is about 3d's uh, threes so the one uh, uh, i uh, the, the the three d's of acoustic neuroma surgery are deep the first d is the defloration or the dedressing uh, now this is this is what my philosophy of doing acoustic neuroma surgery is first of all which is very important is you have to dedress the tumor dedress means you have to remove the arachnoid membranes over the tumor capsule as soon as you open the dura you retract the cerebellum you you land on to the arachnoid membranes stimulated with a nerve stimulator to find that sometimes the facial nerve travels posterior to the tumor so you the first thing which you encounter is the facial nerve so after you have negated the presence of a facial nerve you have to remove the arachnoid membranes over the tumor capsule slowly slowly and you have to Uh, de-dress the tumor or this procedure i call it as defloration and this process has to take some time and it has to be very very meticulous because during the entire surgery this surgery is all about preserving the arachnoid membranes the second d of the acoustic tumor surgery is decompression and the third d is dissection now these two d's they uh, they they take roles as an when required basis uh, you do the decompression make the tumor capsule thin and then lift it with the tumor capsule to holding forceps and then dissect the other structures from the tumor capsule and then when uh, when the dissection there is complete then you more decompress more make the tumor capsule thin and then again lift this with the tumor capsule and dissect the surrounding structure this is how entire surgery goes i mean uh, 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 so the 3 d's of acoustic tumor surgery are defloration or the dedressing decompression and dissection and this is how the entire surgery is uh, is being done i hope i'm clear about this so proceeding forwards now this is how it looks like when you first remove the bone flap this is how it looks like and uh, you see this is uh, let me orient you first this is inferior towards the patient's leg this is the cranial this is the patient's uh, right side and this is towards the floor the patient's left side this is towards the floor this is towards the sky this is cranial and this is caudal is everyone clear about it okay so when you make a craniotomy then you have to do some cheating business i always call it as cheating because you have made a small bone flap and then you have to uh, increase the angle of your viewing now this angle of your viewing is very very important especially in some surgeries uh, especially in medial sphenoid wing meningiomas when you bevel the bone then your angle of vision increases uh, many fold i mean even at 20 degree angle of vision increase it helps you in you know in uh, in achieving your target so meticulously so this is what i am doing right now and then i see here that uh, there is some space i cannot see the uh, the 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 sigmoid sinus over here and uh, therefore you have to drill this type of a bone also and uh, from by means of a drill you have to drill it a bit and you take 
the drill bit. You can take a diamond drill bit, which is more safe as compared to a routine drill, because if it comes into contact with Dura, then it might damage the, the Dura. So it's up to you. If you take the diamond drill bit, it's better. So I am a little fast forwarding it. And uh, you see that I mean, uh, every effort should be to not to uh, let the air sinuses open. And uh, because once they get open, the patient runs the risk of or uh, having a morbidity of, you know, CSA potoria or CSA trinoria. I mean, uh, so all the efforts should be directed towards not opening. And you have to study the preoperative MRI and preoperative CT scans of the patient in order to uh, know the extent of the mastoid air cells. Now you have to assess where, where is the sigmoid sinus. Yes, it is very nearby and uh, uh, some more drilling maybe is required. Okay. You can uh, take your keratin ranges and then uh, uh, remove some of more of the bone till you can uh, get the feel of the sigmoid sinus. I mean, this is the point where you stop uh, drilling the uh, this bone here and uh, put an end to your bony work. I mean, uh, you have to spend some time to do your bone work and this pays off during the entire surgery because this is very important. Even a single millimeter of more drilling will help you in gaining an extra angle of vision, especially when you want to see more on the medial side. So this is, uh, and, and it reduces the brain retraction also. Otherwise, you have to keep on struggling during the entire surgical procedure and uh, your vision will not be that good. So this is ready now. I mean, the bone work is complete and you can see that, I mean, there is no uh, utility of giving a long incision and then going all the way down the neck. I mean, you can, you have the access, whatever you want to do, you have this in this uh, uh, four centimeter long uh, skin incision and uh, three centimeter wide craniotomy. So there is no reason for, there is absolutely no reason for, you know, to, uh, to, uh, give a long in season and uh, you know, subject the patient to um, such long in season is not good also in the post operative period pain and the healing takes a longer time so there is no reason that you should remove the foramen magnum absolutely no reason i have uh, um, seen people removing foramen magnum uh, in order to you know to expand the bony exposure but I mean, in my experience, there is no reason to, you know, to open the foramen magnum. Yes, I mean, if the tumor is going down below, the tonsils are going down below, herniating down below the foramen magnum, then in those cases, you might need, even in those cases, you do, do not really need drilling of the foramen magnum. See, this is normal anatomy and you have to learn to preserve the normal anatomy and as much as possible and restore the normal anatomy. Uh, sorry, sir. I have a question. Uh, don't you have uh, problems with uh, the soft tissue retractors in those kind of uh, small incisions? As you can see, I mean, this is a wonderful exposure that I can get as as much as I uh, can get in a traditional exposure. I mean, these are two instruments. One is the laminectomy. These are normal laminectomies that I use. Uh, okay. One laminectomy down and one is the up. I mean, and I can clearly manage most of the tissue comes in my view. I mean, you can see that. I mean, there is none of the soft tissue which come into my view for I mean, no, really. I, I, I mean, when you use the instruments, don't you have problems when you use it in the tumor with the retractors laterally? Absolutely. So no you problem. have a, you have a good a good angle using those retractors in that small incision. 
Oh yeah, you see that there are two laminectomy retractors. I mean, self-retaining retractors. They are applied one at the lower end of the incision and one at the upper end of the incision, and they keep on retracting it entire during the entire surgery. Okay, thanks. Yeah. So uh, proceeding forward. So now, I mean, this is the the bony work is complete now, and you see that uh, uh, the second most important step before you proceed on to opening the dura. Uh, what I do personally is I release the CSF through a small dural opening. Now a mini opening in the mini opening. Now this is a really a great help during the surgery. Before you go on to embark on to you know to open the dura completely, I what I do is I open the dura a small dura from here as you see shortly, and um, try to drain the CSF from the cerebellar medullary cistern and the cisterna magna. And this procedure is the most important procedure for the entire surgery. And it is the first step after opening the dura. Now, as soon as you open the dura, open it at a small place, make a derotomy, a small derotomy. And I prefer to make a y, inverted Y-shaped derotomy, a V-shape and then an extended limb from the V and goes to over here. So it's an inverted Y-shaped uh, dural flap. You take a, uh, a stay suture in the V and then open the, open, or make a derotomy, complete derotomy over there. Now insert a, a micro, pat, micro cotton patty into the, uh, inside the dura taking care not to evulse or lacerate the cerebellar tissue. Very gently, very gently, you insert your cotton patty inside the dura. Your life is going to become very easy, very soon. Now in all the keyhole approaches, now this is the most important step, the drainage of the CSF. Uh, immediately after opening the dura, all the keyhole craniotomies, this is the dictum, this is the fundamental law of keyhole craniotomy, is to open the dura, a very small dura, initially drain all the CSF, and as soon as the CSF drains, life becomes so simple. Initially, it would be intimidating to uh, some people that, I mean, how do I, there is no space, how will I do, there is no space, but as soon as the CSF is drained, as you will yourself see just now, the life becomes so easy, brain goes down, and there is ample space, no dearth of space, absolutely during the entire surgery. And this is the key, most important key step during any keyhole surgery, and in this surgery in particular. So my, my aim is to insert my cotton petty below the cerebellar tonsil, retract it up, and open the arachnoid of cerebellum medullary cistern. And the moment I do that, you see, life becomes so easy. Cutting more of the dural flap. And this is the lateral cerebellum medullary cistern I am about to approach. Now you see that the CSF will come, gush of CSF will come and Yeah, so uh, this is the lateral CSF coming out from the lateral cerebral medullary cistern, and then you communicate the cistern with the cistern and magna immediately, and uh, your job is done. Some more CSF. This is the most important step, and you should spend some about good 10 15 minutes during the surgical procedure because this step determines your success of surgery. So uh, be very generous, very uh, uh, lax in uh, doing this step in any keyhole surgery. Release the CSF, release some more, release some more, 
till you feel that the now you see the the whole of the cerebellum becomes so manageable so lax so smooth and um, i mean this is a wonderful thing to see uh, for any keyhole surgeon and uh, and the, uh, some more csf coming from the cisterna magna there okay and at the end you what you do is you leave a cotton wick a cotton patty wick which it which i call it as and then it keeps on draining the csf throughout the surgical procedure and then you leave it as such uh, for the whole length of the surgery so the first step of the uh, surgery uh, after opening the dura is complete now and you are ready to open the rest of the dura the rest of the durotomy is uh, done in uh, inverted y fashion as i told and um, uh, that this limb is then extended for uh, up and uh, this uh, whole of the dural flap is raised in the form of a inverted y now try to keep this uh, uh, this dural flap as broad as possible the dural flap which is towards you i mean because this serves the purpose of covering the cerebellum naturally and uh, protecting the cerebellar tissue uh, from getting dried up with the heat with the heat of the light of the microscope so uh, i prefer to you know to not to displace this dural flap away from from over the cerebellar tissue i like to keep it over the cerebellar tissue because this is god's uh, this is nature's uh, protection to the cerebellum and i do not uh, intend to you know to fiddle around with this uh, natural protective dural cover over the cerebellar tissue uh, each and every step is important each and every step i mean how howsoever um, uh, small it looks like but it adds up to reduce the patient's morbidity in the post operative period and a simple cutting up of the uh, dural flap and taking the hitch sutures uh, on the lateral dural flap uh, voice is not clear uh, can you uh, do you hear me hello yes No, yes, let me you know? let me take care of that. Okay. 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 Is that okay now? Yes. Okay. So uh, now the superior cut is at the junction of the sigmoid and transverse sinus. So you have to be very careful not to not to bump into the sigmoid sinus while making this incision. You have to be slightly three or four millimeters away from the sinus, so that not to injure the sinus. And uh, um, you, you take the stay sutures on the dural flap, lateral dural flap. The medial dural flap, you I prefer to keep it as such over the cerebellar tissue. The reasons being, this is a natural protection to the cerebellar tissue during my entire surgery. It does not allow the heat of the microscope to go into the cerebellum and damage the cerebellum by heat. So this is a natural God's gift, natural protection to my cerebellar tissue. So uh, the opening of the uh, dural flap is complete. The second part of the surgery is complete. now you see these uh, stay sutures i mean these are very important stay sutures and you have to ask your assistant the sur your surgical assistant to you know to pull these sutures in a correct direction and uh, for example this suture has to be pulled in this direction this suture has to be pulled in this direction and when these uh, sutures are pulled in correct direction then you see your vision uh, definitely improves many fold i mean your angle of vision is important and when you all ask your surgical assistant to pull these Uh, threads in a correct manner then you can yourself see that your angle of vision your uh, your uh, uh, angle of vision improves margin, um, considerably now you are on the cerebellar tissue protect the cerebellar tissue with cotton patties and you may choose to electively put gel foams over here and over the gel foams you put the cotton patties uh, so that your retraction does not damage the cerebellar tissue at any point during the surgery so lifting up the flaps of the so 
of the uh, dural flap and there you see the tumor there some more csf coming out okay so there is the cyst that i was talking about in the mri you see that this is the cyst over there sitting right there and this is made my day i mean this is a the, the thing which you want to see as an acoustic neuroma surgeon if 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 it is if you are greeted by a csf cystic space initially your day is made i mean this is wonderful and because the reason is that i can get the hold of the arachnoid membranes and remember as i already told arachnoid membranes are the holy grail for acoustic neuroma surgery you see that these are the fine fine membranes which are all there over the tumor capsule and uh, now the most important is step defloration or the dedressing of the tumor is being carried on you see there is no retraction right now there is only dynamic retraction right now which is being done and my whole purpose is to is to dissect the arachnoid membranes from the tumor capsule away towards the cerebellar or the brain stem surface and once i do that then uh, the i will be left with only tumor capsule in front of me so uh, this is the first step while uh, on the tumor on the tumor that you that you accomplish and uh, this is has to be done with great care so no bipolar absolutely no bipolar bipolar is contraindicated in this surgery and because it destroys the planes now once you uh, reflect the arachnoid membrane over from over the tumor capsule then you, uh, you see a yellowish colored tumor capsule tumor capsule devoid of any arachnoid membrane and you are ready to you know to uh, do the second part the decompression of the tumor tissue so uh, this is you see that these are some of the arachnoid membranes that are still there and i am doing sharp dissection over here in order to cut these arachnoid membranes and slip them slowly slowly gently from over the tumor capsule if at all any uh, cautery is required then you have to use that cautery at very very low settings and only as momentary uh, as far of uh, you know touching and going so uh, that is all that you require uh, if you are uh, any time uh, uh, compelled to use the bipolar cautery so <clears throat> now nowhere during the surgery you have you you feel compromised about the space here i mean the space is as big as you can get in any other routine conventional surgery so space is not a concern at all in any of the keyhole surgery at at the end of the surgery you feel like doing uh, you feel like thinking that this exposure even this exposure is large enough for this tumor so this is what i'm doing defloration defloration dedressing dedressing removing the arachnoid now this arachnoid is very very sanct arachnoid very very pristine very very holy arachnoid and this has to be really respected during a acoustic neuroma surgery you see that separating the arachnoid from the tumor capsule from the tumor capsule you, you now i call this a stage of of the tumor surgery uh, making friends with the tumor i mean i coax the tumor i palpate the tumor i uh, plan the surgery i make the feel as to how the tumor is looking to me i make friends with the tumor during this step the defloration the ease of the spl splitting of the arachnoid membranes gives you a picture of the ease during the entire surgical procedure now if you are not able to you know to there are there are some acoustic tumors where they, this 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 is not so easy to you know to separate the arachnoid membranes from the tumor capsule and if this is the case then then uh, you 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 have to really you know to uh, may maybe having a hard time during the surgery so if you are able to you know to dissect the arachnoid membranes very clearly very easily very smoothly from the tumor capsule this is a good sign to have now you see the similar arachnoid defloration is carried out over the top pole of the tumor you see wonderful i mean this is this is the arachnoid capsule arachnoid membranes which now all the neurovascular structures of the cp angle they are here outside the tumor capsule outside the arachnoid capsules and so this is so important and uh, while the tumor is inside it is subarachnoid uh, it is inside the arachnoid membranes the only structure to stop and this is a very important point i am making the only structure 
which is not outside the arachnoid is the seventh ear complex, is the meatal structure. The meatal structures, they are not outside the arachnoid. Hence, when you, uh, there is a need to identify and locate these meatal structures as early as possible in the region. And when you have identified and located them, do not assume that they are outside the arachnoid. These structures are always located inside the arachnoid in an acoustic neuroma surgery. There is no arachnoid between the facial nerve and the arachnoid and the tumor capsule. So you have to be very, very careful. Once you identify these structures, you have to uh, you have to preserve them because there is no arachnoid capsule in the facial nerve, as you will shortly see in this video when I identify the facial nerve. This is a very important valid point I'm making right now. So always remember, all these structures are outside this arachnoid capsule, except the meatal structures. So defloration, your two-hour two surgery, at least 15 minutes have to be given for adequate defloration, adequate de-dressing of the tumor. And this is the time when you talk to the tumor, when you make friends with the tumor. I mean, uh, when you uh, when you show that when you show the respect to the tumor, um, this is the time that I mean I always love to spend time on this uh, on this uh, procedure before I embark on to attack the tumor. First, make friends and then attack the tumor. So this is the this is the philosophy. So the uh, uh, arachnoid uh, the de uh, dressing has been done from all the sides, from the medial side, from the upside, from the lower side. Now uh, the stage is set to, to you know, to stab the tumor in the back, to attack the tumor. So uh, that is where uh, the uh, I have to skip a bit. So you uh, check it with the neuromonitoring. Sometimes what happens is, as I already mentioned, the facial nerve happens to lie, you know, um, posterior to the tumor surface. So, I mean, not many cases, but sometimes it happens to lie. So you have to doubly shear before you know to embark on the uh, cutting of the tumor capsule and decompression phase. Now the second step the, uh, of decompression uh, of the tumor is in process. And you see that I am coagulating the tumor capsule. There is no tumor arachnoid here, so I am allowed to use my bipolar over here and uh, coagulating the tumor capsule. And then we'll be sort of cutting it, making a window in the tumor capsule in order to go inside the tumor and use my CUSA and uh, doing the decompression and debulking of the tumor. So decompression or debulking is the second step of acoustic neuroma surgery. And it has to be uh, done always after the first step, that is the defloration or the, uh, the uh, de-dressing of the tumor, taking a biopsy. And uh, th th this is all the time when you, when you assess uh, that how is the tumor, how vascular is the tumor, how solid is the tumor, how, um, what is the consistency like? I mean, and these all things you have, you know, this has been going on inside your mind as to, you know, to uh, how this tumor is going to behave during the surgery. And um, these all things, uh, whether it is succubal with QSA or not. And in this particular case, I'm quite fortunate that, I mean, I found a good tumor to deal with today and this made my day actually, as you will soon see. So, um, um, coagulating the bleeding points and then uh, using your CUSA. Uh, and next step is to use your CUSA and then uh, sucking away the tumor. Now, um, CUSA has to be, uh, I mean, if you have CUSA, well, it's good. It is not, of course, mandatory to remove the acoustic tumor. You can't, uh, you, you can remove the acoustic tumor even without a CUSA, but if you have this, this is a bonus that you have. So uh, depending on the consistency of the tumor, the CUSA settings are kept uh, at uh, uh, half or three-fourths. And now initially to start with, I keep it as uh, at 75% uh, or maybe 100% in such type of uh, easily suckable tumors. But then as I reach more and more near the capsule, as I make more and more capsule thin, I keep on reducing the CUSA settings. Uh, because I mean, there is a risk that I may puncture the tumor capsule and then go outside the tumor capsule, which is the thing which you don't want at any stage in your surgical 
So the process of decompression or debulking is taking place. So this surgery is all about decompressing or debulking the tumor, making the tumor manageable, making the tumor collapsible so that you can then dissect the surrounding structures. Now you see that uh, after having debulked over here, there is some space which has happened uh, in near the lower pole, and this is what I'm doing. I am de-dressing the tumor from the lower pole here, taking care of important neurovascular structures. Important arachnoid from here. And you see this particular beautiful arachnoid membrane which is there at the lower pole. So at no point in time during the surgery, the arachnoid has to be disrespected. It has to be respected and uh, 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 taken care of during the entire part of the surgical procedure. So cutting more of the uh, tumor, uh, uh, de-roofing the tumor, cutting the tumor capsule, and then applying the CUSA, removing most more of it, making it manageable, making it uh, more thin so that it collapses more and gives me space outside so that I can dissect the and defloor the arachnoid more from the tumor capsule. This is how it is done. I mean, this is uh, only three days that you have to take care of the entire surgical procedure and your surgery is done. This is so simple. Some bleeding, I mean, no, the, the, the problems happen in managing the bleeding if it is, happens to be a really vascular tumor. I mean, so there are some tricks which I want to tell uh, for managing the vascular tumors. Now, if, suppose now this tumor is not so vascular, I mean, meaning thereby that the bleeding is very well controlled by means of applying one or two bipolar and that's it. But sometimes it bleeds like hell, I mean, terrible. So what I personally do is, you know, I take gel foam pieces and then I, you know, pack inside the cavity and then keep them for some time and there the bleeding point is stopped and then move my focus from that point over to the another point. So I keep on moving within the tumor uh, in case of vascular tumors. Uh, the point which is bleeding, I pack it with the gel foam, go on to start poking at some other area and then uh, come back to the previously bleeding area when the bleeding is stopped. So this is how I modify my approach in cases of vascular uh, tumors. Majority of the tumors are not so vascular, but sometimes if your day is not good, then you might encounter to, you know, to have a very vascular tumor like I did last week. So uh, this is uh, sort of a good tumor to do. Okay, so let me fast forward it a bit. Any questions? I mean, uh, anyone want to ask some questions? Sure, the floor is open. Any comments? Any comments? Any questions? Hmm. Any pattern uh, of specific pattern of dissection you follow? Yeah, I mean, this is a good question. I mean, uh, well, I mean, it depends on as to uh, 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 what my personal uh, choice is, is to is to decode the central part of the tumor first, and then go on to decode the lower part, and then come to the, uh, uh, to, the to the medial part and then go to the upper part. The reason is that, I mean, um, you, you have to move in order of preference because you want to save the structures uh, in order of their priority. So, because uh, if you decode it from center first, then it becomes more manageable. The capsule becomes more manageable, I mean. And then if you go down to decode the lower part, then you get first to separate the lower cranial nerves, which are very, very important. And most of the times you get to find the facial nerve here also. So the facial nerve and the lower cranial nerves, they are, uh, they are lying over somewhere near the lower pole. So first of all, do a central decoding and then decode the, debulk the lower part of the tumor so that your seventh eighth complex and the lower cranial nerves are free to get, you, you are free to separate them from the tumor capsule because the tumor capsule here becomes manageable. 
then go on to you know to decode this the medial part and then lastly i personally prefer to go around you know to decode the uh, the superior fold i hope i answered your question yeah thank you there's a couple of questions in the in the chat if you'd like to answer those uh, summit okay okay uh, v asks would you always prefer to keep two pins of the Mayfield head holder above the forehead. Okay, so um, uh, in the lateral position, uh, what I do is uh, the uh, one pin I prefer to, you know, to uh, uh, one pin I prefer to take the pin at the back and two pins in front like this, because these two pins here and one pin there. What you have to see partic in particular is that the one pin which is applied at the back should not interfere with your hand movement over here. Uh, do you get my point? Okay, another question. Go ahead, go ahead. I said that in Mayfield, two pins I apply over here, one pin at somewhere near the anion. Now, when you apply one pin near the anion, the point which you have to look for is, you have to see that this pin here at the back do not interfere with your hand movements okay okay so someone asked what is your pattern for dissection yeah i answered the question i mean uh, my pattern of i i i i i first of all do the central decoding and then i prefer to go at the lower pole which i am doing right now the purpose is if i do the decoding or debulking in the lower pole of the tumor. Now it is here that most of the instances, the seventh eighth complex in the lower cranial nerves gland. So uh, I uh, I do the decoding at the lower part first, so that my capsule becomes manageable, and then I can do the defloration or the de-dressing of the arachnoid membrane uh, away from the lower pole of the tumor first and then save the lower cranial nerves in the seventh and eighth complex. And then I go on to the medial side and then decore it from here so that I can separate the tumor capsule from the brain stem. And then lastly, my pattern is to, you know, to decore it from the upper pole because it is here that you will encounter the trigeminal nerve. Okay, so Bill Day asks, what protocol you follow for N F2 cases. Well, I mean, NF2 is, uh, I mean, it's it's uh, mostly in, in NF2, the nature of these tumors is not uh, like, th like those in the sporadic uh, uh, acoustic neuromas. Most of these NF2 cases are vascular tumors and they are uh, not so well uh, as compared to what in an sporadic acoustic neuromas. So, I mean, the, the thing which I was talking about, like the defloration or the, the stripping of the arachnoid membranes is sometimes not very easy in uh, the acoustic neuromas in the uh, NF2 patients. And uh, you have to really take great care of while stripping of these uh, arachnoid membranes in these tumors. And uh, uh, that's how, I mean, that's what you do. I mean, in these type of cases. Okay, we have another, another question from Satya Shiva Munjal. He says, any tumor size that one should consider as upper limit for keyhole surgery? No, I mean, there's not, there, there, see, I, will, I answered this question. I told in, in the initial uh, part all, only that I mean, there is no limit of the tumor size for a keyhole craniotomy. Uh, the exposure that you do get by means of a keyhole exposure is just the same as compared to what you get in a conventional uh, big craniotomy. So there is no correlation whatsoever as to the tumor size um, um, and the size of the craniotomy. As soon as you open the dura in any case in a keyhole craniotomy and drain the CSF and you have to be very patient about it, then you see that, I mean, there is ample space. There is ample space. And Dr. Satya Shiva was with me also, and I mean, I know him personally, and he has been through um, with uh, many such wonderful surgeries, and he himself has seen that 
size of the tumor is no correlation to the size of the craniotomy. Okay, Satya so asks another question. Is it safe to dissect between cerebellum and brainstem as one decompresses a tumor and makes space in the operative field? The crux is to make the tumor capsule manageable by decoring and debulking. So decoring and debulking is the crux. And as you have to make a balance between decoring, decompression, and the dissection. As you go on decompressing, as you go on debulking, what happens is the tumor capsule becomes manageable. And then is the right time to dissect that part of the tumor capsule from the surrounding structures. So you have to judge accordingly during the surgical procedure uh, as to what amount of what percentage of the tumor capsule has become manageable by your internal decoring. So that part of the tumor capsule only you are allowed to lift it with the tumor holding forceps and then dissect it from the surrounding adjacent structures. Now, these structures can be any, can be low cranial nerves, can be brain stem, can be cerebellum. It all depends on from where you are decoding this uh, tumor from. Okay. Um, Anand asks, sir, when during dissection do you identify the meatal part? Or the yeah. metal part, metal part. I, I'm so not sure. I, do not across. I think he wants to ask uh, at what point of time do I drill the meatus, isn't it? Uh, I'm not sure if it's me metal or meatal part. <laughs> yeah, metal part, yes. I mean, uh, see, I don't, don't generally bother about the meatal part till I have removed at least 70, 75% of the tumor. And my purpose of, uh, um, uh, of uh, drilling the meatus is only uh, to, to, you know, to find the, prog the distal part of the facial nerve, the distal part of the facial nerve. Now, when I come to the facial nerve, when I see the facial nerve, I want to see, I, it is most likely to be seen at two points during the course of the facial nerve. First is the proximal point where it emerges from the brainstem, and the second most constant location of the facial nerve is in the um, fundus of the pore of the of the meatus. Fundus of the meatus. Mind it, not the porous, the fundus of the meatus. So it is these two points where the facial nerve is the most constant location. So I, I, if I want to preserve the facial nerve, I have to locate the facial nerve at these two points, first of all. And then from these two points, constant points, in between, I have to, the, the location of the facial nerve is very variable, which is being pushed by the tumor. So at these two points, I identify, and then I keep on dissecting in between the facial nerve, I separate the tumor away from the facial nerve. So when I remove 70%, 75% of the tumor, I go on to drill the meatus. If at all, I have to drill. And the indications of drilling the meatus, I already explained in the initial part of my talk. When the tumor is much bulky in the meatus, I prefer to drill it. Otherwise, if the, I see that the tumor is manageable, can come out just like that without drilling, I do not intend to drill the meatus, do not intend to disturb the normal anatomy because it is not worth it. You might end up damaging the facial nerve, which is very, very important to preserve. Okay. So this is the Go ahead. medial. Yes, John. Oh, Kiki Terrell asked a question. Kiki, are you there? Do you want to ask directly? Yeah. Hi, okay. Go ahead, Kiki. Yeah. Sumit, everything is yeah. going very well. Well, thank you, Dr. Keki. Glad to see you here. Huh? Yeah, I've been there watching you right from the beginning. But I thought I know. I'll, keep a, I'll keep a low key and let you talk. <laughs> it, is your, it is your day. Uh, it, it's my day because you are here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So actually, my, my comment was the same, that you don't need to, as you very earlier on managed, uh, mentioned that you do not use a coagulator, uh, not only for the uh, surface arachnoid, but, but even for the tumor surgery. Because every time you coagulate the tumor, you are going to stop the bleeding and again you're going to bite it or cut it and again it's going to bleed. 
So it's a waste sure. of time. So unless you come across a big bleeder, you don't uh, stop all these small little bleeding points and instead allow your assistant, allow your assistant to irrigate and suck so that your two hands are busy working on the tumor and, and uh, that way you can go on with the job a little quicker. Correct. So now this is the lower pole that is uh, being, the arachnoid is being separated as you see. And shortly you are going to see one beautiful thing. So this is the rotor flat dissector and this is the arachnoid peeling which is happening from the lower pole of the tumor. You see the lower cranial nerves over there? This is the lower cranial nerves. You see the peeling of the arachnoid. Don't bother about the bleeding over there because if you will coagulate there, then you will lose important place. Now, I mean, you have separated, you have dissected till the, till the limit. And there is a time now that you have to decode it again. You have to make the capsule more manageable. So this is how it goes. There has to be a delicate balance between decompression and dissection. Both of them have to go side by side. Either of the process is not independent of each other. They are interdependent to each other. So do you understand both of them, both of these procedures are very, very important. Decompression, side by side dissection has to take place. Removing the tumor with more QSA. I have to be a bit fast. And then the capsule becomes manageable. Then you go outside, you dissect more capsule. And then you go in, you make it more thin. Then you go out, dissect more. And then this is how it goes on during the entire surgery. Dissecting from the medial side. Only a small peeling, peeling the arachnoid, a small bit by bit, bit by bit. Is a superior part of the tumor. See, at any point of time that you feel that the, the tumor capsule is not manageable, is not able to be lifting, lifted up from the surrounding structure, this only means one thing. This means that you are your, your tumor is still bulky. And then the most important thing that you need to do at that point of time is to debulk the tumor by your QSA. So you have to be very uh, judgmental in this, that anytime that you feel that your tumor capsule is not being able to be lifted up, like as you see here at the superior pole, much amount, 
there is a big chunk i mean at the upper pole that is why this tumor capsule is very very resistant to handling and lifting up so in a short while you will see that after decoring after debulking it's very easy to you know to separate this uh, superior pole from the surrounding structures and then peel off the arachnoid membrane from the superior pole of the tumor So now decompression looking of the superior pole oh, so you, uh, do you want to answer a question more looking so when you deep bulk and when you uh, reach the uh, near the tumor capsule, the feeling of your suction through the cusa it changes. I mean, uh, it, this is the feel that you have to have to experience it only, and then only you can know about it. When you reach the end of the tumor capsule, near the tumor capsule, more and more tumor capsule begins jumping into the cusa. So this is how you recognize that you have reached the uh, proximity of the tumor capsule, and then you have to stop it then and there. Uh, lest you, you know, you will otherwise uh, encounter the tear of the tumor capsule and you will go on to the uh, other side. So this is the least thing uh, that you want to do during your surgery, not to injure the tumor capsule. So this is the feel that you can, you know, get uh, while you are doing QSA, uh, um, doing the internal decompression. Lighting the cotton patty between the arachnoid membrane and the tumor capsule so that that plane is maintained. the cotton patty between the arachnoid membrane and the tumor capsule so that that more debulking from the medial side more debulking from the depth from the medial side now this is the part where this is the brain stem it is, uh, it is impinging on this is the medial part which is impinging on the brain stem the debulking is taking place right now from the medial part of the tumor Now coming again to the lower pole, coming again to the lower pole of the tumor. Why I'm getting these lines on my screen? Now 
now the purpose of coming again to the lower pole is to find my seventh year complex i mean i have not till now found it so i'm getting desperate now it's been about the middle of the surgery and then it is imperative for me to find now the uh, location of the seventh year now so i have to find it now i mean if, if this is high time during the surgical procedure and soon you will be able to see that uh, there is something which is of importance right now at this part of the surgery So you lift the tumor capsule from the brain stem and then slide the cotton patty between the arachnoid and the tumor capsule. taking this all capsule out so that the tumor becomes more manageable more easy to handle as compared to what it was so making the tumor small 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 and so that it is easier to handle and uh, easier to dissect from the surrounding structure this is the strategy coming again to the lower pole now will i start to find my facial from the lower pole and i see that this is still quite bulky so i would like to you know to more decompress it sort of it becomes more manageable easier to separate from the surrounding structures and you see some structure over there which is just now which i will like to confirm it with my neuro monitoring hmm. 
more decompression. Summit, Summit, can you hear yeah. me? Yeah. Okay, I, I can, I'm not getting any audio from you. Yes, 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 I can hear you. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. So now, this is the most important step. I mean, I'm about to localize the facial nerve here at the lower pole, and it's giving me, uh, giving me the potential over there. So the facial nerve is somewhere near the vicinity. So I have to be very, very careful while dissecting over here. Uh, from now on, I mean, so I've got the first clue as to where the facial is at the uh, distal end, probably um, at the now it is at the lower pole of the tumor. So I have to be very careful at this point. So once I have identified the facial nerve, I'm pretty confident that I mean, I have got at least one location of the facial nerve. And then I have to be very cautious about, you know, going in around that vicinity. lifting up the tumor from the brainstem. While during this, this is a very crucial step. While you lift the tumor capsule from the brainstem, you have to ask your anesthetist any changes in the hemodynamic uh, stability um, because sudden ready cardiac can happen while you lifting up the tumor capsule from the, from the, from the brainstem. And important vascular structures run on the surface of the brainstem at this area, especially the uh, mesencephalic vein, you have to be very, very cautious of preserving this vein at this is very important drainage area for the brain stem. So when you encounter this vein, you have to be very careful in separating the tumor capsule from, the, from this vein and take every good care that this vein gets preserved in its entirety. You see that here. This is that vein, the mesencephalic vein, and this is the separation of the uh, tumor capsule from this vein. No stimulation over there, but just checking. Oh, hello, can you hear me, sir? Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, I thought you were commenting and just wasn't coming through. Sorry, say that again. No, I thought you were talking, but it wasn't, the audio was not working. I'm so, I was mistaken. Okay, continue, okay. carry on. Yeah. So lifting the tumor from the lower pole from the brainstem. My facial, my facial now is somewhere here. Can you hear? Hello? Yes, we can hear. Okay. So it is here where I get the stimulation and I will shortly see it.
just checking it it's not here You see that now in, I'm nearing the tuber capsule, so it is sort of you know jumping into the cuisa. So this is the feel that you get uh, during the during doing the cuisa that you are approaching the uh, tuber capsule on the other side. So you have to uh, do your cuisa settings to the lowest, and um, uh, you have to be very careful not rupturing the tuber capsule and going on to the other side, damaging your planes again. Now here is the meatus. You see the tumor entering into the meatus, the superficial, the porous of the meatus. In fact, it's not completely going into the meatus, into the not going in completely into the canal. Only a small portion of the tumor is 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 peeping into the porous. So that is what you see over here. And sometimes the dura of this area is extremely vascular, and you have to be very very cautious about it. And uh, you have to work your I mean, accordingly, to make it less uh, messier at this area. Dissection of the tumor of the of the of the arachnoid plane from the lateral and the inferior portions of the tumor. This is the arachnoid. This is the arachnoid that you have to, you have to preserve. You have to respect this arachnoid, and all the dissection between this arachnoid and the tumor capsule over here. Decompressing again. The porous portion of the tumor, decompressing the porous portion of the tumor. Now it is at that point of time that the question which was being asked before that I prefer to, you know, to uh, to hold my drilling the meter till this point of time when the tumor becomes more manageable. That I come over, uh, that I have decoded about approximately seventy-five percent of the tumor. Then I prefer to come over to my meter portion and then either. If I am drilling the meatus, then I choose to drill it at this point of time. Now, in this case, I was I did not drill. I'm not I'm not planned to drill the tumor from the meatus because this is not very much going into the meatus really, and, uh, and so I would like to you know to decompress that tumor from the porous of the meatus and then take out the tumor from then and there itself without drilling. The meters. There is no need to drill the meters in this per se. Now 
Okay, so this is the lower pole of the tumor, and uh, that's a facial nerve. That's a facial nerve. You see that? That's a facial nerve. So the the crux is that the tumor is separated away from the facial nerve, and it's not like otherwise. I mean, if I again repeat. the tumor has to be separated away from the facial nerve you catch hold of the tumor you separate the tumor away from the facial nerve without stretching the nerve and this is the crux it has not to be the other way around the facial nerve has not to be separated from the tumor and there is a big difference between the two uh, two things i mean and you saw it to how to get it done this is the facial nerve and i was just separating the tumor sharp dissection always near the facial nerve always sharp dissection and you see there is no arachnoid between the facial nerve and the tumor capsule like the one which was i was saying it before you confirm the presence of the of the facial nerve by means of neuro stimulator and uh, uh, the, uh, it gives a response it gives a good response as you see over here this is the facial nerve monitoring um, the triggered emg i mean so this is the triggered emg of the facial nerve so you have to separate the tumor dissect the tumor sharply away from the facial nerve i repeat so this is the most important step when you are near the facial nerve so take your sharp dissector and then you dissect the tumor away from the facial nerve no arachnoid between the facial and the and the tumor capsule you see this is the seventh nerve complex over here this is the cochlear nerve where you see both can you see that i mean is it clear this is the cochlear nerve this is the facial nerve which is very clearly seen and uh, the arachnoid is outside the facial seventh nerve complex i mean the arachnoid is outside the seventh nerve complex the seventh nerve is immediately intimately in contact with the tumor capsule and bears a significant relevance when you attempt to save the facial because here it is there is no arachnoid which is which comes to your rescue uh, when you want to save the facial you have to deal with the facial nerve directly uh, and separate the tumor capsule away from the direct facial nerve here this is a facial nerve over there see uh, this is a shiny silvery white structure and this is the joy of an acoustic neuroma surgeon to see the facial nerve uh, during the dissection as you might all agree with me so this is the triggered emg response again and you have to use your emg again and again to identify not only identify to see for the integrity of the facial nerve something which you don't want uh, your neurophysiologist to say to comment to you during the surgery is the train of emg impulses coming from the facial nerve now if this happens you have to immediately stop because this signifies an irritative injury to the facial nerve with consequent poor outcomes in the uh, post operative period now this when this happens you have to stop a bit irrigate with saline and leave the facial nerve and you are allowed to proceed only when this train of impulses stops uh, um, uh, after your handling stops because this is not a good sign this is a sign of irritation of the facial nerve and if it keeps on going keeps on going keeps on coming the trains keeps on coming then your facial nerve is probably not going to do good after your surgery so this is uh, a particular uh, small technical nuance that you have to keep in mind during the acoustic tumor surgery now proceeding the dissection from the uh, from the inferior pole and the lateral pole of the tumor keeping the facial always in view always in view cutting the arachnoid keeping the arachnoid away apart from the tumor capsule stimulating the tumor uh, so the, the facial nerve stimulating the tumor capsule now this is what the water jet dissection i did now this is a water jet dissection you see that the separation of the facial nerve away from the tumor capsule by water jet dissection it sometimes is a very very special importance a special help during the surgery and it really it is atraumatic to the facial nerve and it serves your purpose of separating the facial nerve 
away from the tumor capsule that's what you want to do at no point of time while during this dissection you need to pull the on the facial nerve because that will injure your facial nerve with not so good results after the surgery now you see that's entire arachnoid entire arachnoid i want to show this i want to show this in slow in the normal speed because this is the most important step during the surgery of facial nerve preservation i am so sorry that i mean if uh, it gets to take long i mean i want to show this in normal speed because this is very important step everyone should see it uh, the residents i mean this is very useful to them as to how to dissect the facial nerve from the always use sharp dissection use your sharp flat dissector use your micro scissors do not approach with a bipolar near the facial nerve uh, come what may and do not put a uh, weight of the cotton patty also on this facial nerve now this is even this is so sensitive that if you keep your cotton patty over this facial nerve then this will get damaged might get damaged with the weight of your patty so it will be very very gentle very very delicate with your uh, with your uh, facial nerve you see the tumor capsule no arachnoid between the facial nerve and the tumor capsule it cannot be as clear as this uh, can you see that this is the facial nerve this is the tumor capsule we don't find any arachnoid plane over there all the arachnoid which is there which is outside the facial nerve over here so you have to be very cautious while separating the facial nerve and in my hypothesis is that it is therefore very very uh, the facial nerve injury is very very prone to happen in in the acoustic neuroma surgery because this is not protected by means of an arachnoid plane the seventh eighth complex is not protected you see the arachnoid is outside the facial nerve and nowhere between the facial nerve and the tumor capsule the arachnoid comes so you have to take this anatomical concept clearly in your mind if you want to save the facial nerve am i audible all the during this time am i audible yes hello okay okay yeah, yeah. so then some more debulking after separating the facial nerve some more debulking from the porous side i need to skip this removing the entire thing now here i am safe i mean there is nothing like you know facial nerve i is is not going to come over the superior part the lateral part of the porous i mean yes in the medial lip of the porous i have to be very very careful about the facial nerve but there is nothing no good structure in the lateral lip of the porous so i can freely take out the tumor tissue from here now separating the medial part from the brain stem separating the superior pole of the tumor see the arachnoid there arachnoid acoustic surgery is a play of arachnoid membranes it's a arachnoid surgery like the meningioma surgery is an arachnoidal surgery acoustic tumor is an arachnoidal surgery and you have to you do this surgery beautifully when you pay respect to the arachnoid membranes i mean they have to be very thankfully respected uh, during this these two surgeries Excuse me, son. It. Yeah. Yes. yes John. Can we? Yeah. Can we have some interaction? I think some panelists want to interact with you. Yes. 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 Okay. Go ahead. Uh, the people that wanted to interact, I see you have a lot of posts here, so just come in right now and interact with Sunnet. That's the power of this platform. So please use it. So. Yeah. Hello. Go ahead. Go yes. ahead. Hello. Uh, this is uh, Professor Mohammed Fahmi from Alexandria, Egypt. Uh, I would uh, uh, thanks. I would like to ask if you have a 
a large tumor, I mean uh, the diameter more than 35 millimeter. Uh, you want yes. to start the dissection uh, starting medially or laterally uh, a large tumor once more uh, near the uh, lateral, I mean enteroditary meatus. Thanks. Well, it all depends on two the tumor extensions. I mean, I hope I, I, I have answered this question already in the initial part of my of my discussion. Well, to again answer this, I mean, it all depends on to whether where are the tumor extensions. If the tumor extensions are more medially into the brain stem, I will decode that portion first. If the tumor extension is more onto the lower pole, I will decompress that lower pole first. It depends on case to case basis. You have to study the MR. You have to study the preoperative imaging very carefully, and then have to plan your surgery accordingly. Well, in this case, this was uh, forty four point five centimeter size in in the uh, AP dimension and some five centimeter in the lateral dimension. So, I mean, this was the way I did the decoding in the central part first and then went to the lower pole, and then the medial, and then the upper pole. Can I add more, a uh, little piece? Uh, I have already seen Professor Majid Sami. Uh, when he is dealing with the cerebellopontine angle lesion, of course, uh, he will start even in large tumor, regardless the direction of more gross where it would go. It's starting usually in internal auditory meatus because he need to start on the lateral aspect where he got the normal anatomy and then proceed from the lateral to medial and the up or down. Uh, this is my inquiry. Thanks, more. Hello? Yes. Yeah. I mean, on, on certain strategy of starting a large tumor on the cerebellopontine angle, some people like Professor Majid Same on Hanover, Germany, he would like to start laterally, uh, starting in the internal auditory meatus, uh, so he can start from the normal anatomy laterally after a, uh, drilling of a little bit about five millimeter of internal auditory meatus and then going up and down after uh, making a central debulking. So he, he used the huge cavity after central debulking uh, to get more room to reach to different direction. This is Are what you, I have done. If you... uh, uh, did you use the same strategy? I mean, starting laterally yes. to get the normal anatomical boundaries because, uh, for example, in neurofibroma, uh, usually starting uh, in the internal auditory meatus near the Schwann okay, cell so attachment. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Your question. So before I answer your question, I want to show the uh, delegate something. Now, this is the sixth nerve, which is uh, on the superior pole that you are seeing here. And, uh, hello. Uh, and uh, you see the arachnoid membranes over here separated from the superior pole of the tumor. Now to answer your question, I mean, this is what exactly I'm doing here. After central decoring, after the central decoring, I, I embarked on the lateral portion of the tumor. And now in this, I already told you that in this tumor, can you hear me? Can you hear? Yes, yes, I am hearing you, yeah. This tumor, Hello? I tend to drill the meatus because the tumor is not going that much into the meatus. It is stopping short of the porous. So after the central decoring, I went on to the lateral part of the tumor and then dissected the tumor, removed the tumor from the lateral part from the porous and then coming again to the, uh, you know, the medial part of the tumor. And then this is how uh, exactly the sequence of events is being taken place. So in the strategy is exactly the same. I mean, this is how Oops. Yeah. The last tumors. Completely agree to that. Yeah. May I make a so comment? See, May I make a comment this is, on this point? Just, just a minute. This is the I want to show this is the arachnoid of the anterior portion of the tumor over here. 
completely preserved and uh, the the, um, the um, so vascular structure on the upper pole of the tumor the superior cerebellar artery is beyond this arachnoid membrane yes professor keki please yeah sumit you are doing a wonderful job i am i'm appreciating your surgery uh, in response to Thank this doctor from alexandria in response to what doctor from alexandria said you see i uh, assisted assisted professor sami for um, at least 1000 cases um, during the yes yes this is professor mohammed fahmi from alexandria egypt hi hello how are you how are you professor nice to you hear know, your voice uh, you are a professor uh, let me yes. see your picture uh, professor yes. torel yes sir yes sir you are torel hello how are you <laughs> <laughs> you still look you still look young <laughs> because uh, we have we have already met on uh, on multiple international uh, meeting abroad one of them in uh, on india and on on bombay i guess that's right on asian meeting yes i was in alexandria last time when nabil organized yes. a meeting yeah 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 But of course before corona time <laughs> hello torel how are you so, alhamdulillah everything is fine thank you very much yeah perfect this is good the dissection um, of the tube the upper pole is complete that is what you just saw actually so if the tumor is uh, large and obscuring the a view of the canal you may yeah. the tumor you may debug the tumor at the beginning if the tumor is small and you can visualize the canal very easily then you can start from the canal so um, it depends on the size of the tumor and the way it uh, covers or obscures the view towards the canal yeah i am uh, first ask about a large tumor uh, ranging or above 35 mm sometimes after opening the dura and draining some csf you will find the, the dome of the tumor uh, even you can hardly reach to the lateral or inferior so it is first big choice is to make partial debulking and then starting from if you can from normal anatomy i mean from the lateral or the internal auditory meats that's the point Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Correct. Yes. So, last stages of the tumor removal, and uh, some more last bits of the tumor capsule being removed, and then soon I will come again back to the facial nerve. Water dissection. Professor Fami, are you hearing me? Yes, yes, yes I am hearing you. So uh, yesterday, day before on Friday, we had our webinar on complications in neurosurgery, and oh, and as yeah, and as expected, Majid Sami was my uh, guest, and he was moderating half the conference. It was a three-hour conference, but it went on yeah. for four and a half. Uh, uh, actually, actually, I missed this, uh, but uh, yesterday uh, I was uh, on a webinar with the Professor Osam Al Mufti yeah. and uh, Professor Yazargil. Yeah. If you know uh, Professor Osam Al Mufti, he was my uh, my professor and I supervised my MD degree for skull based uh, approach on the anterior and the middle cranial fossa. Wow. uh on 1990 while he still on uh, Jackson Mississippi so wow. actually he is my old professor professor Osam Al Mufti <laughs> he was wow. also i met him yesterday yeah. <laughs> was professor Yazar Gil and uh, <laughs> professor Ali Karsha i guess yesterday <laughs> also uh, there is uh, five speaker uh, uh, all uh, of the speaker are very high level Uh, regarding the micro neurosurgery especially the skull based surgery it is staying about uh, more than 3 hour uh, also i think uh, have been 
transmitted by uh, Zoom uh, application. Well, uh, sir, thank you very much for uh, your input. Yeah. Summit, where do you want to go from here? Where do you want to go? Uh, go from now? No, no, Summit, I think, I believe. Uh, did you want to continue on, uh, Summit? Uh, uh, yes, yes. Uh, yesterday, uh, I think no, no, it will no, be. I mean, no, Summit, the speaker, the presenter. Did, did you want to continue, uh, Summit? Uh, or Yeah, or... yeah, of course. Yes, oh, yes. Thank you. From his family, thank you so much. So the last, I was stages of the tumor removal. So this is very important. I mean, this is the most important step of the surgery. So every surgery, I compartmentalize the steps of the surgery as the priority of the importance. And this is the most important step of the surgery because this is the last bit of the tumor tissue which is remaining attached to the facial nerve, which requires removal. So um, approximately half of this last bit of the tumor has been already removed. And what you're going to see now in the next final 10 minutes of the presentation is the remaining dissection of the chunk of this porous tumor from the facial nerve, preserving the facial nerve intact and um, uh, stimulating it at, at times. And you see this is the facial nerve here. And this is the remaining uh, tumor uh, chunk of tissue, uh, a small amount of chunk of tumor tissue, which is attached to the facial nerve. And always sharp dissection, always remember sharp dissection over here, no blunt dissection, sharp dissection, cutting the arachnoid with the uh, micro scissor, stimulating the, uh, with the neuromonitor at intervals of time, and then using it as a dissector also at times, and you see the entire length of the... Now, there is an uh, important uh, thing here, which I want to tell you, the most fragile spot of the facial nerve. Now, it, the most fragile spot of the facial nerve is here, where it takes a sharp acute 90 degree bend from here to go into the porous meatus. So at this sharp bend, you have to be very, very careful about breaching the integrity of the facial nerve. And most of the injuries of the facial nerve, they happen at this sharp bend which is the combination of the fixed part of the facial nerve and the mobile portion of the facial nerve. So you do not, you are not allowed at all to pull on the facial nerve because if you pull it along with the tumor tissue, then this facial nerve will get evolved or will get contused from this portion of combination of this dynamic and the uh, fixed portion of the tumor. So, and there is something wrong. I mean, this is why it... I think you just... Okay, so there, just a minute. There were some, some things which, important things which I wanted to... Okay. okay. Okay, okay, okay. So this is the rule for facial preservation, which I wanted to project to, to convey to the uh, uh, residents. The, always dissect the tumor away from the nerve. I always stressed in, in the discussion. There should be no bipolar or CUSA used near the nerve, never. There should be always a sharp dissection over the facial nerve. Stop the dissection if the train of EMG impulses comes. Use water jet, jet dissection off and on at times and leave the adherent tumor. There is no harm in leaving the adherent tumor rather than removing it all and lending your, subjecting your patient uh, uh, to the lifelong facial palsy, carrying away um, a face which is deviated, which is not socially acceptable. There is no, absolutely no harm in leaving a small two millimeter portion of the tumor adherent to the facial nerve. No shear has to be there at the weakest point of the nerve, which happens to be at the junction of the static portion and the, uh, and the, and the mobile portions of the nerve at the lip of the porous acousticus. Then it start from the fixed points of the nerve always. And these fixed points uh, of the facial nerve are at the fundus of the meatus, where you drill the meatus and then explore the uh, tumor, remove the tumor from the fundus of the meatus, number one and the proximal portion where you identify the facial nerve just anterior superior to the choroid plexus at the proximal location. So these are the two fixed points and then you can choose electively to work to and fro proximally and distally along the entire length of the facial nerve. So this is how you uh, dissect the facial nerve, how you preserve the facial nerve. These are very, very important valid points to consider during the entire 
uh, surgical dissection and this is how you can you know improve improvise on on your surgical outcomes of facial nerve preservation after the surgery and there is believe me there is nothing more satisfying as uh, what uh, to see uh, your uh, patient um, having a normal face especially more so if she happens to be a young beautiful lady all might agree to me on this uh, so this is the removal of a small portion of the uh, tumor which is attached to the lip of the porous acousticus and uh, very low setting of the cusa only removing the uh, tumor inside the arachnoid and then you leave go off of the cusa don't use it again now and then uh, remove this this capsule here which is attached to the lip of the porous i want to show it in the normal speed here because this is important cut more of the tumor capsule remember there is no arachnoid over here this is the tumor capsule and this surgery is a keyhole surgery this is always i do it in a high magnification i mean this is a high magnification um and uh, it helps you in visualizing things properly uh, the keyhole surgery has to be always done in the high magnification sharp dissection near the facial nerve always sharp dissection again thinning the tumor attached to the uh, facial nerve as much as possible without damaging the facial nerve this is the crux to finding a beautiful outcome of facial nerve preservation after surgery see there is no arachnoid between the facial nerve and the tumor capsule you see that this is my hypothesis the arachnoid is here which is outside the facial nerve is inside the arachnoid well opposed to the tumor capsule so you have to be very cautious always and this is the reason that facial nerve is so sensitive while during the acoustic tumor surgery and so much hype about saving the facial nerve so because there is no arachnoid here to save you from after effect damage so the last bit of the tumor the last bit of the tumor another 5 minutes more john okay. another 5 take, minutes take as take as long as you want yeah i i think there are some people that want to ask questions so take your time yes 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 so this is the final part of the portion of the tumor which is you know some small centimeter uh, sub millimeter sub centimeter portion of the tumor is still clinging on from the facial nerve i will see to that that i mean if it is easily removed i will remove it otherwise i will choose to electively leave it because there is no harm in leaving a small amount of small millimeter of the tumor rather than damaging the intact nerve and there you go the neuro monitoring shows a wonderful nerve uh, potential elect recorded here and uh, this means that the nerve is still functioning so uh, this is functionally and anatomically preserved facial nerve 
after the end of the surgery. And here, as you say, that I would, this is the small portion of the tumor, which is still clinging onto the uh, porous, which I am coagulating from the anterior lip of the meatus, and which I'm coagulating and, 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 and attempting to remove it. So this is the complete removal as much as possible. Some part of the tumor tissue attached to the porous lip is being left in order to save the facial nerve. And here you see beautiful, the brain stem over here. This is the facial nerve, which is stimulable functionally. And this completes the end of the surgery. At the end of the surgery, taking the endoscope inside, well, we see, well, I should say that, uh, I mean, this is not the endoscopic view of this patient because in this patient, I was not able to take the endoscope in. My light source got bad, but I wanted to show this endoscopic view to my viewers there as to how does it look like and what is the advantage of taking in the endoscope. Uh, uh, you can see the bits of the tumor tissue. You can see the intactness of your neurovascular structures. And you can see some small bits of tumor tissue which are still left. Here you see this is the trigeminal nerve. In another patient, this is the facial nerve preserved here. This is the sixth nerve over here. And this is the tent here, the petrous vein, the dendys vein over here. And this is the petrous, a small part of the tumor. This is the brain stem side. This is the cerebellum side, which is complete tumor removal has been achieved in this patient also. So at the end of the surgery, many a times endoscope quite helps in identifying and locating the residual portion of the tumor and we can be further uh, removed with the help of either an endoscope. Now, these are the lower cranial nerves, uh, which are very well visualized and safely preserved. This is the pica, which you see over here among the lower cranial nerve. So complete, uh, this is the facial nerve. This is the post-op CT scan of this patient. And um, this is the first night of CT scan of the patient, which you see the complete tumor removal. And uh, of course, uh, the patient was completely intact immediately after the surgery. And you see, you see, this is the immediate post-operative clinical profile of the patient just after coming from the operation theater. And uh, you see she is uh, no neurological deficit and uh, the facial nerve also is completely intact immediately after the surgery. So this is the post-op MRI. Now this post-op MRI somehow could not be done immediately post-op. Normally I do immediate post-op. Uh, MRIs, but I mean, in this patient, this was done one week after the surgery. Now, let me tell you, this is not the good time to do a post-op MRI because you will see some blood over there, like the case I'm seeing here. There is no residual tumor, but there is a blood over here, which comes in after 48 hours. If you do the post-operative MRI, after 24 to 48 hours, you will get to see this blood traces into your post-op MRI film. So this is not a good time to do, but hence uh, I did it. I mean, the patient came to me in my follow-up visit then I, since it was not done previously, I had to do it as a baseline in order to compare it with future MRI. Complete tumor removal over here, you can see, and uh, there is no uh, residual tumor which is there. And this was the uh, uh, follow-up post-op visit. I saw the patient uh, in the, after eight days of surgery, eight or ninth day of the surgery, probably complete facial preservation. Of course, the hearing was not there before also, and uh, this was the in-season uh, after the, uh, in the first follow-up. So the pulse, I mean, uh, this is, always remember there are some, there's some things which have to be remembered during the caustic neuroma surgery. Uh, th this is the bread and butter of a skull-based surgeon, and every one of us should know how to operate on this beautiful tumor, and it is a satisfying surgery, and it is a beautiful surgery. Acoustic neuroma is a subarachnoidal tumor. Always remember the three Ds of acoustic neuroma surgery, defloration or de-dressing of the tumor. 
then decompression or debulking, and the finally the dissection. The decompression and debulking and the dissection have to uh, complement each other. They are interdependent on each other. They are not independent of each other. Seventh eighth complex is to be identified relatively early during the surgery, and the sooner you do this, the better. And the most best points where you can identify in the, 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 this complex is at the proximal and the distal portions. The proximal portion is located anterior superior to the choroid plexus at the brainstem, whereas the distal portion of this complex is located in the fundus uh, uh, of the um, uh, acoustic meatus. The meatal contents are not separated from the tumor by the arachnoid, and as you have seen in the video as well. There is no arachnoid which separates the seventh eighth complex from the tumor tissue, and therefore this makes it imperative to uh, carefully preserve this important complex uh, while you are dissecting this complex from the tumor tissue. Adherent portion of the tumor to the seventh eighth complex is left. There is no harm in leaving two or three millimeters of the, or even one centimeter of the tumor attached to the uh, facial nerve in order to save the facial nerve so that the patient has uh, a. Good facial profile and socially acceptable facial profile after the surgery and a good outcome. Thank you so much. Okay, great, Summit. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, now we can interact. Okay, now is your chance to. Uh, that's the beauty of this platform is being able to interact with a seasoned neurosurgeon online. So let's take advantage of it. I have I have a question. Yes, go ahead. This is Dr. Torelia. Yes, yes, Dr. So, so uh, Sumit, it's an excellent, uh, very wonderful uh, uh, exposition of your surgical skill. Uh, my, uh, my criticism here is that it's a shame to, after such a brilliant operation, to leave behind some tumor. Uh, my question is, could you not go beyond the tumor, to, that, that means lateral to the tumor, into the canal, and get it eased out from there because you had a limitation. No, this tumor was not going into the canal. This, so, this so, tumor so was. Then, so, what was the reason for leaving that little bit of the meatus? So, uh, if you would have seen at one point of my dissection in the facial nerve, when I tried to remove the uh, to cut it sharply from the facial nerve, there was a there was a disturbance, there was a stimulation or irritation of the facial nerve. I mean, mm -hmm. they, it, so it, this was my surgical uh, decision at that time that I chose electively not to remove that small portion of the tumor. Patient being 60 year old lady, so I mean that hardly makes any difference in, in leaving a small portion of the, of the tumor. It does not hit on my ego to remove each and every <laughs> small bit of the tumor tissue in order to save her patient now and not to have a uh, socially unacceptable facial profile in the post-operative period for the patient. Only, yeah. only, only you as a surgeon would know exactly how badly adherent it is and therefore it is, it is best to surgeon discretion, left to the surgeon's discretion. Any other questions? By the way, Professor Katie, the French beard really suits you. I mean, you are looking so young and so smart. Oh, I'm not even to see my own wife over here, but who is the who are the other people there? I don't know. All right, okay. All right. Okay. Yes, any other question? Anyone else? Hello. Yes. Hello, Sumit Boss. I Uday here. Hi, Uday. Boss, it was an excellent surgery. The only question I wanted to ask you is that with the small incision, uh, skin incision that you have placed, don't you think that it would have uh, helped you if you have taken a curvilinear C-type incision to get some pericranial harvested from that place so that in the event of having a dura closer, you might have used that pericranial patch in uh, doing a closer. Uh, because so, with the small incision... Uh, yes, yeah. I understood your question. So, I mean, um, had I had more time about, you know, to um, uh, show you the 
characteristic for the dural closure in a keyhole craniotomy. I would have loved to show that maybe in some other uh, webinar. I mean, some points have to be carefully looked into my, uh, lo uh, kept into mind while closing the dura in a keyhole craniotomy. And um, in in every particular case, I mean, the dura is primarily closed in a keyhole craniotomy. And in this case also, and I take a special care of closing the dura myself or I leave it on my trusted, most trusted first assistant, because this is the second or maybe even the first most important step of the surgical procedure. And it can ruin your entire surgery, especially if it is a keyhole craniotomy. And, and the most important complication that you face with after doing a keyhole craniotomy is a pseudo meningocele, which happens in the post-operative period. And sometimes this is so nagging that I have myself burned my fingers in one or two patients and, and, and this does not uh, accept it to go. So there are some things which have to be really kept in mind while closing the dura and in the post-operative period uh, that, uh, while doing a keyhole craniotomy. And these are, uh, first of all, make sure that there is a watertight uh, and airtight closure of the dura. Uh, 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 and most of the times it can be done primarily. If it is not done primarily, you can choose to apply a uh, pericranial or the muscle patch. And then I always use a, a tissue glue in order to uh, seal my uh, dura at the end of the surgery, number one. Number two, um, after the, in the post-operative period, I always and always used a, a crepe bandage application over the head. And this, what, what, what it does, this crepe bandage is it applies a tamponade effect till about two to four days after the surgery. And once it heals, it, it sticks to the dura, the tissue sticks to the dura, then there is no problem of having a pseudo meningocele. But yes, you raised a very valid point. At, um, you have to be very, very careful about dural closure, especially in a keyhole surgery. Thank you, boss. Thank you. It was a wonderful presentation that you you tried to show all the uh, queries that were coming in our minds in a stepwise manner. As usual, you have been a wonderful teacher uh, and good friend and a mentor for me, boss. Thank you. Thank you. You are a, you are a you are a gem of a guy. Thank you so much. Thank you, boss. Okay, more comments, questions. <clears throat> Okay. Okay. Very good. Uh, you got a lot of people come up to come out uh, today. Uh, some chats I can see here. No, there are some chats which are which I can see. Can I? You had a lot more. We, we you know, we had, it was a long session, but that's the beauty of these. You don't have to stop. You you know, we're relaxed. We're not. we we don't have a deadline. <laughs> Yeah. So there is, there is so, a question. I mean, uh, someone is asking, could you explain how to drill the meatus safely? So this is the topic of a separate webinar. I mean, this is a completely different webinar of one hour, how to drill the meatus. So maybe next time uh, there is some Dr. Anand here who wishes to know. Yeah, so sure, sure. We're, we're very time. flexible. Very yes. flexible. Maybe and, next time. Yeah, we can pivot. We can make changes. Uh, it's not like we have a rigid schedule. We can go according to the needs yes. and the wants. And that's the beauty of this platform. We don't have to arrange it six months ahead of time. We could arrange it the day before if we wanted to. So I, I thank you very much. I thank all the panelists for coming up. And uh, we'll, we'll talk later about scheduling another one. Yes, and a special thanks to John, I mean, who dedicated a great, uh, I mean, uh, his platform and wonderful uh, uh, effort uh, for, on his part. I mean, uh, thank you, John. You have been so kind and supportive, I mean, uh, uh, for allowing this uh, presentation to go to uh, the viewers. And it's a wonderful exercise, wonderful thing that you're doing to spread the knowledge on your platform. And it's um, worth appreciating. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's a wonderful platform, and uh, you get to meet all kinds of people all over the world. It's wonderful. So we'll see you next week. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you, everyone. Bye -bye.